Hello, I'm Derek Walker, the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church, and we're in a study of the book of Revelation, and we've been seeing that there's a repeated pattern of movement between heaven and earth. And this signifies that the events in heaven and earth are directly connected. You know, actions on earth call forth judgments from heaven, and the judgments released from heaven are then manifested on the earth. So, for example, the church, after the church is raptured to heaven in Revelation 4, Christ stands up and takes the scroll with seven seals in Revelation 5. This is the title deed of the earth, and this action signifies he's about to take forceful possession of the earth. And then in Revelation 6, as he breaks open the first six seals in heaven, judgments are released on the different areas of the world system on the earth. And these, uh, as these seals are opened, what we see happen directly co corresponds to the birth pains that both Jesus talked about in Matthew 24 and Paul talked about in 1 Thessalonians 5. In the context that these birth pains would actually, uh, what happens, that uh, the th those birth pains are the things that happen on the earth that characterize the start of the tribulation. Then, Revelation 7, we saw last time, describes an interlude before the seventh seal is opened. And that seventh seal marks an escalation in judgment because the seventh seal contains the seven trumpets. And these seven trumpets are direct judgments of God, direct bombardments from heaven on the earth. Whereas the first six seals were indirect. They involved God were removing his hand of mercy and grace that, that was restraining the chaos and the darkness and the evil, uh, taking over the various realms of the world system. So when he removes his hands, the different realms get plunged into darkness. The interlude in Revelation 7 reveals that even in the midst of judgment, God is a good God, a God of mercy, um, because this interlude that we saw in Revelation 7 reveals God preparing, um, saving, uh, preparing, anointing his evangelists for the tribulation. 144,000 of them from the 12 tribes of Israel. And so this shows that now that the church is raptured, the anointing comes back on Israel to represent him to the nations. These evangelists spearhead the evangelism in the tribulation. And it shows that a major purpose of God in the tribulation is a great soul harvest. And Jesus said about this time in Matthew 24 that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all nations and then the end will come. And so the purpose of the interlude in Revelation 7, before the judgments escalate with the opening of the seventh seal, uh, the purpose of this interlude is to prepare and establish, protect and release his evangelists for this tribulation ministry. Now, the first four angelic trumpeters in heaven are told not to blow their trumpets until the 144,000 are sealed on earth. We saw that in Revelation 7. And this again demonstrates that what happens in heaven is closely connected to what happens on the earth and vice versa. Well, then as soon as the 144,000 were sealed on the earth, then the seventh seal was opened in heaven. And the first trumpet is blown, releasing judgment on the earth. So in other words, there's a time of preparation of these 144,000, but once they're sealed, then the seventh seal is opened in heaven and the judgments of the trumpets are poured out. In other words, the ministry of the 144,000 actually happens exactly the same time uh, as the seventh seal. It, that ministry begins the same time that the seventh seal is opened in heaven. So let's have a look at the opening of the seventh seal in heaven. It's in Revelation chapter 8. As we said, as soon as the 144,000 were sealed, this seventh seal is opened in heaven and the first trumpet is blown releasing judgment on the earth. It says, When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. 
And so we see here that the seventh seal contains the seven trumpet judgments. And we read on. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And then it says, the first angel sounded. These verses make it clear that these divine trumpet judgments about to be released on the earth are in response to the prayers of the saints. Likewise, we saw a similar thing in Revelation 5.8 when the 24 elders presented the lamb with golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And that was just before the first six seal judgments were released in Revelation 6. So here in Revelation 8, only when these prayers ascended to God was the fire of God thrown down to the earth and the seven angels prepared themselves to sound their trumpets. Just as the seals contain the, trump the judgments of God initiated from heaven, so likewise the, the trumpets represent judgments of God from heaven. In fact, from the very start of the tribulation, it's a time of judgment and wrath, the whole tribulation. We also note that the first trumpet is sounded soon after the seventh seal is opened. So in other words, as soon as the 144,000 are sealed, the seventh seal is opened in heaven, and the first trumpet is blown. Thus, the 144,000 start their ministry on the same day as the breaking of the seventh seal and the sounding of the first trumpet. Now, this isn't right at the start of the tribulation, but after an interlude, during which the 144,000 are being prepared. This interlude is probably only just a few months because God would want to launch his evangelistic outreach as soon as possible in the tribulation. It makes little sense that he would delay for years before he gives the world an evangelistic witness, calling it to repent and trust in Christ. So in conclusion, we have an initial time period after the first six seals are opened, during which the 144,000 are prepared and sealed. Only then is the seventh seal broken and the first trumpet blown. So the seventh seal and first trumpet corresponds with the start of the ministry of the 144,000 on earth. Next we need to ask what event on earth calls forth the escalation of judgment connected with the breaking of the seventh seal in heaven? Last time we saw that there's only one candidate and that when we synchronize it with the seventh seal, everything fits perfectly in place. And that is the Antichrist covenant that marks the stars of the last seven years, known as Daniel's 70th week. That is the event on earth that must correspond to the seventh seal in heaven. Last time, we deduced that there must be an initial period of time from the rapture and start of the tribulation to the making of the Antichrist covenant, which starts Daniel's 70th week, for otherwise the rapture couldn't be imminent. Likewise, now in Revelation, we can see that there must be an initial period of time from the start of the tribulation to the breaking of the seventh seal. The solution that fits perfectly is that these are the very same periods of time. Thus, in other words, it is the covenant of death that Israel makes with the Antichrist in unbelief, which particularly calls forth the breaking of the seventh seal and the release of the trumpet judgments. This is the only event, the Antichrist covenant that starts the 70th week, is the only event early in the tribulation that could possibly correspond to the seventh seal. This synchronism of the seventh seal with the start of Daniel's 70th week is confirmed when we look at the ministry of the two witnesses in Revelation 11 and its relationship to the 70th week. The connection is the rebuilt third temple where the two witnesses minister for 1,260 days as a vital part of the temple ministry. Now many Christians have trouble with the idea of a rebuilt third temple with sacrifices as something that's in the plan of God. But this is clearly revealed in four scriptures from both Old and New Testaments. First, it was prophesied in Daniel 70 weeks. Daniel 9.26 says, After the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off or executed, but not for himself. 
Jesus, of course, didn't die for his own sins, but for our sins. And then it says, after the Messiah is cut off, the people of the prince who is to come, and that's referring to the Antichrist, the prince to come is the Antichrist, the people of the prince to come shall destroy the city, Jerusalem, and the sanctuary, that's the temple. Now this was fulfilled in AD 70 when the Romans completely destroyed the second temple. But then the next verse, which describes the 70th week in the future, the last seven years before Christ's return, reveals that a third temple will be rebuilt and it will be functioning at the time of the end. Verse 27, he, that's the prince to come, the Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many in Israel for one seven, that's a seven years. In the middle of the seven years, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering, and at the temple he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end decreed is poured out on him. This tells us that the covenant Antichrist makes with Israel initiates the final seven years, the the 70th week of Daniel. This covenant involves the Temple Mount and the Jewish Temple. For a major part of this covenant must be to release the Jews to be able to worship at their third temple. How do we know that? It's because of the way that he breaks the covenant at mid-tribulation. How does he do it? By stopping their sacrifices and rededicating the temple to himself as the God to be worshipped. And he puts up this abomination of desolation which is an idol to himself, also known as the image of the beast. It's significant that the key issue today of any peace treaty between Israel and Islamic nations is the status of Jerusalem and in particular the Temple Mount. It will seem as if the Antichrist has achieved the impossible by bringing such a treaty to pass, but it will soon become apparent that he's been deceptive, that he only makes this treaty to gain power, and when it suits him, he'll break it. Notice, however, that in the prophecy, God calls it a temple, a real temple, signifying it's a genuine temple of God. God doesn't call it an abomination. In fact, the Antichrist defiles it with his abomination. But if it wasn't a God-ordained temple, it couldn't be defiled (laughs) because it wouldn't be holy in the first place. This becomes clearer when we look at Jesus' reference to this prophecy, this very prophecy of Daniel, uh, when he describes the events of the mid-tribulation in Matthew 24, verse 15. Jesus said, When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that's what we've just looked at, Standing in the holy place, then let those who in Judea flee to the mountains. So here Jesus confirms there will be a third temple in the tribulation, and he describes it as the holy place. This can only mean that it's an ordained temple of God. Also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul describes how Antichrist will desecrate the third temple at mid-tribulation describing him as the man of sin, the son of perdition, who who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Notice again, this confirms that there will be a third temple, and it's called the temple of God. Finally, Revelation 11, verse 1, it describes the setting of the ministry of the two witnesses in the tribulation. And it says, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. The angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar and those who worship it there. Again, this confirms there'll be a third temple with an altar, and it's called a, the temple of God. So this third temple will be part of God's plan for the tribulation. But it will only function for three and a half years before it's desecrated by the Antichrist. This means that God does not intend it to be a reversion to the old covenant uh, way of worship and its sacrificial system. God isn't planning to bring that old system back, in other words, uh, of the Old Testament and its sacrifices. No, because it's only going to last for three and a half years. God's purpose is something different. It's simply God's way of reaching Israel with the gospel and giving her a final call and opportunity to repent and receive her Messiah. 
Thus the third temple is an important part of God's plan to reach Israel and the nations with the gospel in the end time. This is consistent with the purpose of God's temples, to be a light to Israel and the nations. And so the third temple of, is God's ordained method of outreach to Israel, especially in the first half of the tribulation. See, God will allow the Jews to offer animal sacrifices in this short time, because like the sacrifices of the Old Testament, they function as visual aids to the only effectual sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. See, basically, animal sacrifices never saved anyone anyway. They were simply visual aids. And so God will use them again as visual aids. And it's especially necessary for God to remind the Jews that it's only through blood, the blood of a sacrifice, that you can be forgiven of your sins. This is because Judaism has been without a temple for almost 2,000 years, and it's become a bloodless religion where the sacrifices of man's works have replaced blood sacrifices as the basis of salvation. So God has to remind them about blood sacrifice again for them to understand the sacrifice of Christ for their sins. So God will allow these sacrifices as part of his witness to Israel, but this, wis but this wi witness would not be clear and it wouldn't be complete or it wouldn't be effective without the ministry of the two witnesses in the temple. Because as they are making their sacrifices at the altar, the two witnesses will be proclaiming Jesus Christ as God's lamb who has already been sacrificed for them and to put their faith in him. The ministry of these two witnesses being a light calling Israel back to God was actually prophesied in Zechariah chapter 4 where the prophet was declaring God's plan to rebuild the temple. As well as speaking about the second temple that was uh, rebuilt by Zerubbabel soon after the prophecy, Zechariah also looked into the distant future and saw the third temple where two anointed ones would form a vital part of the temple ministry of being a light to the whole world. Let's read that from Zechariah. He said to me, what do you see? So I said, I'm looking and there's a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it and on the stand seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. What are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? So he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. You see, he sees a lampstand, in other words, the menorah of the temple. And this represents the ministry of the temple as being a light to the world. And he also sees two anointed ones supplying the oil to the menorah, causing it to shine brightly. In other words, these two anointed ones form an essential part of the ministry of this God-ordained temple, causing it to function not just to be a light to Israel, but to the whole world. For it says that they stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Now, Revelation 11 takes this prophecy of Zechariah and claims that it is fulfilled by the ministry of the two witnesses in the tribulation temple. Let's read that in Revelation 11. The angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. That's a reference to Zechariah 4. We saw from Daniel 9.27, the 70th week of Daniel, that the Antichrist covenant initiates the 70th week and the third temple ministry. Now, Revelation 11 tells us that the two witnesses are an essential part of this temple ministry because as soon as the temple is introduced, we're introduced to the two witnesses. Thus, the two witnesses must minister during the first half of the 70th week while the temple still operating as a temple of God because they form a vital part of this temple ministry. You see, that wouldn't be possible in the second half of the tribulation after the Antichrist desecrates the temple and turns it into a temple to himself. And so the two witnesses start their ministry at the start of the 70th week, 
immediately after the Antichrist covenant, which is also when, as we've seen, the seventh seal is opened and the first trumpet is blown. And also when the 144,000 start their ministry. So lots of things happen at the same time. The seventh seal, the first trumpet, the 144,000, and now the two witnesses start their ministry. And they form part of that ministry of the temple. Some people say that the two witnesses are in the second half, but what I've just shared with you shows that that can't be. So these two witnesses minister for 1,260 days, or three and a half years in other words, at the temple, and they're calling Israel and the world back to God. These three and a half years, using a year of um, 360 days, that's uh, actually a called a time. So sometimes this is called a time, times and half a time, three and a half years. And so these two witnesses minister for the first half of Daniel's 70th week. So the two witnesses start ministering when the temple starts to operate at the start of the 70th week, which is the last seven years leading up to the return of Christ. And they will continue for three and a half years, the first half. They dominate the temple and they refuse to be removed from it because we're told if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. What they do, they preach the gospel as I described, but they also announce and they call down the plagues of the first six trumpet judgments. We read that in verse 6, that they have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. And then we read that when they finish their testimony at mid-tribulation, the beast, the Antichrist, that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them and kill them. This happens, of course, when the Antichrist invades Israel and breaks the covenant. And their dead bodies will lie in the street, literally the broad plaza of the great city. That's the Temple Mount, the great city being Jerusalem, where also our Lord was crucified. And then it, we read on. Then those from, the peop from all the peoples, tribes, tongues and nations will see their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And now those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those, all those who dwell on the earth. Now this makes very little sense to a reader before a hundred years ago. But now it makes perfect sense because of modern technology. How can all the peoples of the earth see their dead bodies for three and a half days? unless there are TV cameras on them, and a system to communicate those images around the world. Also, why do all the people of the world blame these two men for tormenting them with punishments, unless, for the past three and a half years, they had been prophesying to the world through the TV cameras every trumpet judgment before it happened? So now we can see how perfectly how everything fits perfectly once we realize that the seventh seal is broken on the same day as the start of the 70th week. Number one, Israel makes a covenant with Antichrist, initiating the 70th week, the final seven years. And that covenant allows them to have their temple worship. Number two, God immediately responds to this with grace by taking over the temple and by releasing the two witnesses, to start their ministry at the very same moment. And their ministry lasts, as I said, for the first half of the 70th week. But thirdly, God also responds with judgment by loosing the seventh seal and blowing the first trumpet. And because this is all on the same day, we can see how perfectly this works because the first act, therefore, of the two witnesses on their first day of ministry is to announce the first trumpet judgment. Remember that they start their ministry, we've deduced, the very same day that the seventh seal is opened. So they appear on the Temple Mount, they announce the first trumpet judgment, and very soon afterwards that trumpet judgment is released from heaven. And they will then from announce the, the next six trumpet judgments in the same way, 
during their three and a half year ministry. So again, the first act of the two witnesses on their first day of ministry is to announce the first trumpet judgment. They will also announce the first six trumpets during the first half of the tribulation. Whereas the seventh trumpet actually is not during their ministry because it's blown immediately after they die. Then there's three and a half days um, lying on the Temple Mount. Then they're resurrected, they ascend to heaven, and then the seventh trumpet is blown. And the seventh trumpet is actually going to blow throughout the next, the final three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. And finally, we can say that the seventh seal with its seven trumpets, is he was held back until the 144,000 were sealed. So the 144,000 also start their ministry at the opening of the seventh seal, at the very same time that the two witnesses start. So we can see how everything fits together once we realize that the seventh seal is broken at the very moment of the Antichrist covenant being signed on earth. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And our vision is to spread the in-depth teaching of the word of God to the ends of the earth, but we need your help. And on our website, oxfordbiblechurch.co.uk, you, you can find the, a way you can help us financially, and we would be so grateful. Well, I trust that you've been enjoying our series on the book of Revelation. I just wanted to make you aware that I've also taught all the way through the book of Revelation as a CD series. And here we have three CD boxes with seven or eight CDs in each of them. And it takes you all the way through the book of Revelation. So if you want some further study on that, this wonderful book, I recommend these CDs. Each, each CD box is 20 pounds, but if you get them all together, you can get a discount, all three of them, for uh for 50 pounds or 20 pounds each thank you for watching you can watch more of our teachings on our oxford bible church roku channel and Derek walker youtube channel you're most welcome to join us at our church services which are every sunday at 11 a.m and 6 p.m at cheney school headington oxford ox3 7qh you can order CDs, DVDs, books and other great products from our online shop at www.oxfordbiblechurch.co.uk or by calling 01865 515 086.